So we have three things that we have to cover today, but I don't think we have time. So we have to choose between the three of them. Conflict resolution, um, leadership, and horizontality versus horizontality. Like, like hierarchy or horizontal organization. I have a proposal to speak about conflict resolution. Is that a good one for us to go? Yeah. Can we also touch up on leadership? Okay, so we have 30, no, 20 minutes, 30? We can, 20. So we can do 10 and 10 and touch them like really briefly. Okay, so should we just talk about like specifics? So people have like specific questions on conflict resolution, like places where you guys get stuck. <coughs> is any any like specific? Like, is there any like rule of thumb of a good time where? Like if there's a conflict where you just keep hitting a stopping point, like whether, like when is the point where you should try to seek outside, like help? Uh -huh. Okay, so I think everyone, in, especially in a co-op, should be trained in some methods of conflict resolution. I think every single person should have some sort of reading or training. I think it's better to have somebody from the outside to come and do a training before you have conflict mm -hmm. than when you have a conflict. Uh, and I think one of the good things um, about conflict resolution is, well, like if you do it, if you do it preventively, like if you prevent the problem, it's, it's easier to deal with because conflicts are always going to happen, and even in between two people, it's conflict. So if you're working with more than one person, I mean, I, I don't know, I have conflicts with myself. So. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, but. So I, I think this is an important thing to do, to have a conversation about how you're going to deal with it <coughs> and maybe have it a document of how you deal with conflict. What are the things that you think you have enough resource in your group to deal with and what are the things that you don't? Um, and I think one, one of the good thermometers is what are the things that are going to make you like go to jail or you know close your organization? Those should definitely be handled yeah. by. Yeah. She's here, my. Can we close the door? Yeah, so we're going to close the Um. So, I mean, if you have a lot of money for this, or you're going to lose a lot of money, you. If you lose a case, then maybe it's a good idea to have somebody from outside. Or if that that person is taking a lot of energy, if you already have tried to solve a conflict and you're not getting anywhere, and instead of doing work, you're dealing with a conflict all the time, and you stop. I think there's a lot of places that you can get free help. Like there's a lot of groups that do this for, they love to deal with conflicts. Um, so I, I, I think could be very expensive, <coughs> but also could be not as expensive. There's a really good free one in Worcester, the um, Center for Nonviolent Communications. They're great. Mm -hmm. It's a bunch of very old people. Yeah. Very knowledgeable. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. 
but there's Richard, right? Richard, yeah, Richard. Sure. And yeah. I'll pass around their brochure. You can jot down their contact info. Yeah. So Richard and Marge. Marge. Yeah. Yeah. I really, I really like them. Um, so I think it's a lot of stuff um, wrote about this because it's a big issue, especially in democratic run organizations or socially just organizations because it's, it's a lot of systematic issues that uh, create conflict. Um, so Ayorta have like a very good uh, way to deal with resolution and I really like it because it's very well thought and it's easy um, but <coughs> If it's a very hard, not like conflict, you might need somebody. Like if not, if, if it's something about trust, right? So if it's not trust in your organization, it's really hard to deal with conflict within just the group. So that that might be an, a, one of those things that you will need somebody from outside, or if somebody that is in a leadership role, is a person creating conflict, you might also need somebody from the outside. Um, so, um, I mean, I put the, it's, I think this is in the documents, but I, th I think the most important one is the first one, uh, it's like, <coughs> if it's a conflict and everybody talks about it and everybody is willing to resolve the conflict, then you might be able to do it by yourself and, and within the group. But if you cannot even talk about the conflict, like it's the big elephant in the room and nobody's talking about it, but if everybody knows that it's an issue, it might need to. Or a friend. I, I mean, it might be like somebody that is not in the core group that might be less biased. Um, I think I think you you guys that have roots, there are other <coughs> roots. There might be people in roots that can not be biased. Maybe in the board, or you know, or is in Stone Soup mm. itself that knows the organization enough, that cares about the organization enough, but is not biased, that you can use. She found a new court. Well, but, it, but if people are clear their biases and are upfront to those, I think it's mine as well, you know. I mean, everybody has biases. Um, so anyone have any like example of a conflict that have gone unresolved <laughs> and can give us like a case study? Some, something like really hard. <coughs> Interpersonal or conflict in terms of just unresolved things in the like, well, in, in an organization, I mean, or, or if you have in your co-op, even better. Um, I worked with an organization a couple of summers ago, and we were trying to design a society of co-op, even though we don't really have an idea of how to do this. And one thing that we found was there were two people who had extremely opposing views of how to organize, and it got to the point where it got personal and like how the views are formed and it never went resolved. So it just like completely broke down how the, the whole entire group broke down. And like the group dynamics in general. So yeah, like, we didn't know how to deal with it. <coughs> so why do you think you could have done better? I understood like you said have someone do like a conflict resolution, like a mediator come in, which seems more destructive, but having <coughs> like know how to deal with the conflict. 
conflict prior to that, like actually you know, facilitating a talking, but yes, like a grievance, that would have been much more useful since when a mediator came. It was too late. It was. Anyone have an idea of another way they could have deal with the issue? I missed the beginning of it. So she was, she was saying that it, they were trying to like create a business as, or project as a co-op. Two people have very different views on it and it became personal and then So I, I think one of the things that are important um, with conflict resolution um, is to make clear from the beginning that like you are running a business and even though if people are friends or whatever, that when you do doing co uh, stuff about the business, is business stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not personal, right? To have that separation between friendship or non-friendship and work. Uh, because that, that happens a lot um, in co-ops, that a lot of people work with people that they like, yeah. and usually they're friends, and then and being enemies because they have different ways to run a business. So we could have great friends that are capitalists, and they don't believe in the co-ops, and you shouldn't start a co-op with them. But but if it's a clear understanding, right, of like we are in a business, we have in a conflict as two people that are in business, and it's not personal. That that might be one of the good rules to put in or stuff to put out there before that happens. Because when when you start getting mad about something. Um, so, so having a, a policy of conflict resolution is important and having done your due diligence on finding other resources so when you have an issue you can quickly find someone. Um, we found it, it's key that people buy into that whole process you know, before a conflict arises. Again, it's like <coughs> they have agreed that they're going to be in this co-op, that they're going to see it through in this co-op, in, in this mediation process, or have to leave. You know, to just pretend like a conflict doesn't exist, or if someone else brings it up and it's a, it's a really important issue for someone else, but that person isn't willing to do the, the mediation process, then it's, it's really hard. And, um, and uh, we have like a three-step thing. You try to deal with it one-on-one, -on -one, right? Go and talk to the person if it's a small thing. Hey, stop leaving your shoes right in front of my door. You know, that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, if it's a little bit bigger, it's like, you know, bring it up at, at a meeting or ask for a mediation within your co-op. Maybe a neutral person to mediate or maybe each person has like a support person. You could set it up either way, right? Someone that's that is on their side and helping them do the discussion. Um, and if that still doesn't work, third is to find outside support and someone trained in mediation. Roots even has a fourth step that's like a board member who's trained but not totally outside. And that comes before that the before board. the outside one. Yeah, and I, and I think it's, it's important. I, I think if you have gotten trained in that stuff, you even know how to deal with it if you have a conflict with someone and it's easier. Um, you know what is coming. You know, you think twice about making a big deal about something. You think about resolving it better. Yeah, if you have buy-in in the process, it's also important. And I, I think it's, it's, it's even more important to have than having uh, a decision-making process that is super democratic. If, if you have dynamics that haven't been worked out, mm -hmm. 
it doesn't matter that you have the most democratic decision-making power if somebody's like, anyways, then nobody's gonna do what I think, so F it, you know, or, or you know, the same people make the decisions all the time, so why, why we have a decision-making process? So like that's usually, I, I think usually the conflicts come in, in decisions, right? And how decisions get made or, or something that you didn't agree. So I think it's important that it's, it's a policy that everybody agrees on and when it's new people, to know that it's a policy, to know the consequences is something like, you can have a policy that also for somebody to leave the place, you know, in good terms, hopefully. If, if they feel like they don't fit or it's not the thing that they want to keep doing anymore. Because it can become very self-destructive, like you can lose clients, you can lose friends, you can lose um, organizations over you know, something that could have been managed at the beginning, like you were saying, the project just fell apart. So, and also like, I, I know that people don't like to deal with conflict, but as earlier as you can work on, on that, the better, like when it's not a lot of other things on top of it, right? Because then you don't even know what the real problem is because there's a lot of things on top of it and it just gotten like a snowball, right? Mm -hmm. Got all these layers. Okay, any other comments, questions, or ideas? So one of, one of the other things that is not very used in the U.S., but is used in other places is um, have a cell reflection um, session. So if somebody have an issue, usually it's like you have that issue and that person get attacked about it, but if you give that person a time to maybe like, maybe a, a written note something that you say made me feel this way and I feel like you're being whatever, would you please check on that and reflect if, if you think you have that issue or not and how you see it. Maybe could have been a misunderstanding, right? Like somebody, somebody touched your leg because it was showing, like I, somebody was telling me something that happened in an bike, like somebody was teaching someone how to put the leg and in the pedal or something, and, and and somebody thought it was not the right thing to do. So it could be cultural, right? Like could be a lot of age difference or you know perception. So I think sometimes self-reflection, you know, talk to somebody else. I feel that way. Talk to uh, I would reflect myself. So self-reflection has been a way that other people have deal with conflict. So like, I'm gonna reflect on this, I'm gonna talk to other people about this issue, and maybe in, in a week we can get together and talk about it, instead of like attacking at the beginning. So that's another preventive way of like, oh, maybe this person, like even if, if it's something that happened to you and you feel hurt, you can still say something about it, in but not in an attacking way. So that, that creates that space of like, well, I still believe that you have good intentions and I mm -hmm. still want to work with you. So what happens when somebody does deal with things in an attacking way? I don't know. I like when somebody says things to me that are they're up front. front. They're up front. front. Right, but sometimes it's a projection. Of, you know, you're assigning motivations to somebody that they don't recognize or acknowledge. And so... Well, if somebody's attacking you directly and you feel that, you can say, I feel attacked. I want to really listen to you, what you're saying, but when I'm attacked, I'm just not going to listen to you. So right. I think you can say that. I mean, I like to, I like People to can think say that. that you can just keep that, yeah, that there are, that when smoke leads to fire, you can still put it out and and move on, you know, but so I don't know if there's any any process for that, any sort of like 
Mediators, mediators often encourage people to make I statements instead of you statements. This is what I feel, you know, or this is my need, I need this, you know. Um, there's a whole, then there's, there's this whole thing around nonviolent communication too that's like, um, you know, I feel this when, when this happens instead of you make me feel this is, is a big one that um, there's lots of lots of material on that that you can look up if, if that's useful for your fellow. Um, or maybe an in-person when things are heated, an in-person exchange isn't the best thing. It's it's writing it down or talking to a third party and then being able to bring it up to each other. You know, there are other techniques that can be used, and if it gets to that point where it's it's really hard to hear the person because they're, you feel they're attacking or someone's getting very defensive, then maybe, maybe using someone who's more, who has some right. more training and can diffuse that. Right. So I think it's helpful to go through those trainings. Mm -hmm. yeah. Stone Soup is holding a mini one and maybe a longer one next year too with, with the Center for Nonviolent Solutions. Oh, so excellent. It should be open to others. Excellent. So, I think we should move to the yeah. So, is a worksheet in your packet about leadership? Um, uh, and you guys should um, definitely work on this. You want to teach a class today? Uh, so I, I think I think I would recommend that you guys use the worksheet in in a, in a meeting or but it's, it's really important um, to talk about it because I, I feel like in co-ops especially is a lot of dynamics that get created, positive and negative, about around leadership. Um, and culturally, I, I feel like systematically, the roles of leadership has been held for years and years by white men. And, and I feel like very often, for one reason or another, that gets to be the the norm. So that creates a very uncomfortably like if you're creating a space that's supposed to not be about the norm, but about real democracy or real horizontality, the conversation about leadership is a very important one. Um, so, I don't know, I don't know if people feel like going around the room will work on like where they feel like there are points that they feel leadership themselves and maybe one thing that is very challenging and then maybe we can have a conversation around that. Who wants to start? I don't want to start. So one thing that you're very good at, or you feel like is a positive when you live leadership role in your co-op, and one thing that is very challenging for you to be a leader. Anyone? I can start. Yeah. Um, one thing that comes really easily to me is, is <coughs> making my voice heard, which is great for me. Um, so if I have something to say, it's a pretty good chance I'm going to say it. Uh, but one thing that I struggle with is uh, I'm very efficiency focused and like goal oriented and I want to always be moving forward in the direction that I think is where we need to be going. And so sometimes I can be quick to dismiss other people who are who may be giving input that doesn't to me seem like it's relevant at the time. And not only is it's not always the right call to just 
to dismiss it, but I also um, sometimes dismiss it like really like not just like more aggressively than than I think is good for fostering a, like a good dialogue. Thank you for that. I don't feel like a leader at all. I never feel like I have. I don't feel like I'm a leader. I feel like I'm a nag. And, um, <coughs> and, yeah, and I want things to move forward, and I want to see everything so things are moving forward. And I get very frustrated instead of trying to figure out how to um, act in ways that... Um, Yeah, I just, I get frustrated, too easily frustrated. Yeah, and you'll make a person But that could, that's also be like, <coughs> it doesn't, yeah, because it's not too easy. I mean, you're doing that just to make sure that things are going. And I feel like that's something that's really needed in a group that a lot of people underappreciate. So if you are able to communicate that well, then I think you'll be like a really good leader. So the communication thing is something that I really would like to work on. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
um, we look for leadership with like the older members and like the staff and just kind of like defaults to them I think a lot of times, which is like just one of the biggest problems. Um, <clears throat> I think I need to work on like slowing down, listening, connecting with people, understanding where they're at outside of the meeting or decision or work thing um, to better understand like how we can move together forward on something and like I get impatient with folks sometimes in, in work settings um, and. I think a good leadership quality um, is that I'm, I'm always looking for other ways for people to step up as leaders. of our co-op, I think um, mostly just like on job sites, I think is where I think um, my uh, productive, my leadership qualities are productive, um, just because of like, you know, learning about uh, like contracting work in a non-consensus based, non-cooperative setting, mm -hmm. and that would also be the challenge for me, is that, is wading through the difference between being a crew leader and also like a horizontal member and like finding my place there and you know working collaboratively. person or a person that have 
good communication skills or experience. So I think one of the challenges in co-ops or one of the things that co-ops challenge is those norms. And I, I really, one of the things that I really like about being in a co-op <coughs> is that a co-op challenges the system and the norm. You know, and, and, and it's interesting that the things that happen. Um, so I, I think all the things that you, everybody say here, um, is important to work on. Um, work on better communication skills, better follow-up and follow-through. Like, you know, when you're in a meeting and you know that you're gonna be a follow-up meeting, get agreements before that meeting like ends. So it's like, if you say, oh, we can do another meeting, okay. Who's gonna be in that meeting? hold people accountable, right? Because um, what happens is, is this type of leader that do it itself all the time. That is a, it's not that he's a great leader, it's just a great worker, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that prefer to do the things themselves and try to hold all the people accountable. And that is kind of self-serving, right? So. I don't think it's a good space in a call for a person like that. Um, but you can use a lot a good worker, right? In a, in a business, having a good worker is always good. But in a co-op is is a different dynamic, right? So I, I think working on those challenges and challenging the system and be honest about this is going to be difficult because you're challenging the norm. Like people from outside, if you're dealing with, like you were saying, if you're dealing with people that have less skills than you, if you're dealing with people that don't have the same experience, if you're dealing with clients that don't want to talk to a woman, they just want to talk to you, like I bet you it, all of those don't help to you also have a horizontal structure. But you can say, well, you know what? Sometimes you have to challenge that or lose a client sometimes or, you know, I mean, you have to decide, do you really want to be in a co-op and face the challenges? Maybe the clients that you have are not the clients that you should have. And maybe at the beginning you can't do that, but over time you might be able to say no to one or two. And you might get more businesses if people that like see that is a woman and the one being in the crew or sometimes you know you have to play it right and see how it works and take a chance um yeah with with the roles of leadership I, I think it's also like a good conversation to have like what what people think what kind of leader <coughs> they want to be or have Right? Like, do you want to have a leader that's a good listener or a leader that is a good worker? Or, or how can we value these different resources and different aspects of leadership or different sort of personifications of leadership? How can we value them all? Because I think in a service, you know, that expertise is an issue. It's always an issue. How do you, and co there are co-ops like Equal Exchange where people are just plugged into roles, you know? It's not like people rotate and, and learn different tasks and share what they know that much. In a smaller co-op, I think we can bring those democratic ideals to the fore and really sort of realize them better, but it's still an issue, you know? Mm -hmm. How do you share expertise? And it's one of the big frustrations that we have that there's never enough time you know, <coughs> for, like, um, for skill building, you know? It's just doing the work. 
I mean, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, I, I, I think deciding to have a co-op, a lot of people think it's easier than having a regular business, but I, having both, I feel like you have to be really knowing what you're getting into, or having the time, or having the want, and sometimes you don't have all those things, or having the money to <coughs> Yeah. I need the money and make it just for fun. Um, yeah, in, in these exercises, I, I feel like it's a lot of it, like bonding as exercises and leadership building exercises that sometimes we feel silly as adults doing the stuff that you were doing when you were in your like soccer team or when you were like, but they really create community and create, um, and, and you learn, like what Matt was saying, you get to know that person outside the business and then you get to understand a lot of the conflicts. Oh, it's not that this person is pushy, it's just that's their personality that just loud and move the things, so, right? But it's, if you know that person outside a conflict, and, and you realize that that's just how that person is, you might be able to to have a different perspective on, on that. I think we have to leave it there. I wanted I wanted to talk about horizontality and, and hierarchy, but I, I think a little bit of the conversation of coffee exchange, and maybe we can celebrate and maybe have one-on-ones on that, but. I think being in a democratic um, workplace doesn't mean that it's going to be a non-hierarchical one. Mm -hmm. and so, and that that might not be something that you can achieve in all co-ops, and you have to decide: do you want to make money or you want to be horizontal? So, so. I mean, coffee exchange is a great business. Equal, e equal exchange is yeah. a great business. It's a very big but, yeah. but it's not horizontal, so. Yeah. Um, did anyone have something that is really burning their pants before we can um, I'm wondering if we're confusing uh, horizontality with um, collective collectivism. I mean, there's a there's a grid that some workshops use, um, and it's it's you can be anywhere on the spectrum of collective to individual, and you can be anywhere on the spectrum from uh, hierarchical to egalitarian. And you shouldn't assume that because you're not collectivist, you're not egalitarian. Um, was maybe everybody already knows that, but um, it was enlightening to go to a workshop a few months ago about that um, and, and realize that I'm in a different place from most of this group on that collective to individual spectrum, but I hope I'm pretty close to the same place on the hierarchical to egalitarian <laughs> spectrum. Um, and it's a it's a learning experience for me and a challenge to uh, be in that difference in that zone. Maybe we do a co-op academy three. <laughs> Super advanced. And we have like really deep conversations on structures and <coughs> process. I think, I think there might be critical masses where some of this makes more sense than others. Like if you have three people in your co-op right now, it, it's, it's kind of equal and horizontal, but once you add 10, it changes. Once you add 20, it might change even more. Once you add, you know, 
it just depends on how big it is. As to how it you perceive it, how you organize the structure of the business in your head, even if it's a flexing. Yeah, but I, I think size matter, but I also feel like culturally what the system is could could affect a lot of that. You know, in a country where money and time are very equated, it's, it's hard, but in places where you have a lot of time and not a lot of money, it might not be less. I think it's, it's depending on, on what you want to achieve or what kind of business. Maybe a coffee shop that has so much money in a in a cup of coffee that you can make. Maybe you have time for for having other other things, and, or if it's a simple thing. So can we give Danya thanks? She's a volunteer facilitator and help plan this whole co-op academy. Let's go to And I have a couple announcements before we go into our final discussion about where we're going from here. Um, first, there's an offer on the table from a local entrepreneur here in Worcester named Luz Gonzalez. Many of you, many of you know her. Um, she's run a, a company called Pure Juice for a year. It's a juice bar over on Highland Street. <coughs> um, and she wants to know if anyone's interested in making it into a co-op. She's interested in being part of that transition or selling it to a group to make it into a co-op. So if you're interested, you should talk to me if you don't have her contact info or stop by at the juice bar and see if she's around or she works at Community Realty right next door on Highland Street and talk to her if you're interested. And she's bilingual, um, right? Yeah. And she's so, bilingual. So that's an opportunity out there. And if anyone's interested, please do follow up. Um, and then uh, Worcester Roots and the Solidarity and Green Economy Alliance, Sage Alliance, is holding uh, a free campaign training on um, in almost two months, so it's a save the date kind of thing here. Uh, January 29th, it's a Thursday at 5 p.m. So if if you're interested in, and this we'll be talking specifically about the Sage campaign, where we're you know pushing anchor institutions, big universities, to buy from co-ops, <coughs> to get involved in that. And Sage meeting is next week, next Thursday at 5:30 here. Um, I believe that's the 11. No. Um, yes, the 11. Um, and one more announcement is that uh, the Eastern Conference for Workplace Democracy. We've said it a few times. It's a big co-op conference that's happening here in Worcester. First time here in Worcester. First time in a, a mid-sized city like ours. Um, uh, July 10th through 12th. So save that date. But also, if you're interested in getting involved in the host committee, we need people that can help with housing. Scott's already working on that. Connect with him if you want. Like solidarity housing, places that people could stay for even cheaper than the Clark dorms. It's happening at Clark University, by the way. Um, we need people who uh, know musicians or other performers that might want to be part of the event. Uh, there's actually a budget for it. So if you want to get your friends paid to play music for an event, this is a good one to be involved in, Sergio. Um, uh, local showcase and tours of what's going on in Worcester around co-ops. Um, and this is extended to Providence people, for sure. You know, um, There may not be a way to get down to Providence, but if there's a way to feature Providence co-ops in a, in a showcase and a tour, you know, we want to make that happen. Um, transportation. How do you guess? And venues and lots of other stuff. So, uh, Danya's on the coordinating committee of the Eastern Conference, um, and their monthly conference calls. Neely is a paid organizer. I'll put you in touch if you're interested. And and they are willing to create 
like a mini economy during that time. So some of the services that the co-ops do, they will pay for it instead of paying somebody else. So like transportation, food, media coverage, media coverage um, translation, anything. So if, if folks um, are part of the hosting committee, um, is a good chance to get some work. And also, it's a lot of opportunity to connect with other co-ops and learn from them and actually create a movement. Um, so the name, we just decided on the name is Connecting to Impact. <laughs> hey, I didn't choose the name. No, it, it's a good name. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense in Spanish. Uh, doesn't make a lot of sense in English either. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like NASA. Three. Well, if you two. Two impact. Boom. Whoa. Well, it's kind of like launching the movement is right. what they're trying together. Yeah, like. So in these last few minutes, um, we wanted to continue the conversation we started last time about where do we go from here. Uh, Julius threw out a couple ideas of monthly gatherings with some presentations and discussions about um, building a co-op business association and also connecting with Sage's campaign about the anchor institutions, right? About um, working with colleges and, and hospitals, there was more to the Sage campaign, not only connecting to anchor institutions, but also doing education, youth um, getting engaged with the schools more, and and doing things that are um, fun. Monthly video film screenings about co-ops and things like that. So Sage is a good place to connect next week, 11th. Um, but what about other ways people want to meet up monthly or towards a co-op business association? I think Look on that's that a website. really great idea. But I don't know if any, you know, people are really into a monthly, another monthly meeting. Maybe, maybe bi-monthly. Maybe this one in front of the one here. Or like a monthly hip hop show instead. Yeah. <laughs> or something. Or even do something virtually, I think that's Or we could do something fun and and make it a sort of sharing thing too. Mm -hmm. Like a forum where everyone can kind of share ideas and information. Brainstorm not necessarily having to meet because we're all like a Yeah, we could do something online, but also come and come together over a film and you know, do a co-op, co-op bop. Co-op bop. Why we didn't have bop. you in the conference name picking? <laughs> <laughs> Although co-op. Co-op. Good. Boom. Good. Kohab. Kohab. Yeah. Kohab. Kohab. That sounds like kebab. I like kohab. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so. Uh, so on the forms, there's topics, uh, uh, a request for you to put down topics what? for the, there's three evaluation forms. Could you grab them on the printer? Yeah, we could. You've already done one. two. One is just for us to assess how we're doing in terms of knowledge increase and stuff. The other one's to get ideas of where your co-op is at and where you're going going forward. So that one's like, what what do you need help on going forward still? Um, and who are you going to ask for help? Uh, Worcester Roots, uh, you know what we do, right? And we also have, there's a staple three-page thing. I think there's one on the printer right there, maybe. Um, so that three-page thing, if you're considering working with Worcester Roots and you're not already being incubated, um, this, these are things we can offer, and, and um, or even if you are and need to focus on what, what Roots is offering, Diggers, for example, look over this three-page 
stapled sheet. And there's a few of those floating around. And um, Cooperative Development Institute is one of the older technical assistance groups in the area. So they have a good network of lawyers and co-op developers with you know expertise in housing and all sorts of areas. Um, Co-op Fund of New England around financing, and, if, um, and they have that grant, that technical assistance grant. Boston Center for Community Ownership. You've met with, uh, uh, you've met Stacy, right? She's the, the main staff person at BCCO, uh, and they do co-op development, hands-on stuff. Uh, we've used a lot of resources from uh, Aorta Collective, anti-oppression resources, especially, and helping you figure out systems in your co-op that are really good for that. So there's lots of resources out there um, to, to keep this going. Don't be like, oh, we did the academy, we have everything we need. Um, don't be isolated, stay in touch with all of us. And there's a third evaluation form that is just being sent around. Yes? Did you grab it off the printer, Kim? Yeah, It already passed around? That, no? There's a third one that is uh, about how we did as facilitators and how we did with the co-op so you can give more feedback in depth like how we can improve it in the future. So please do fill that third one out too before you go. Or if you have members who aren't here, we'll send it out with the notes and please have those sent out, uh, filled out and sent in. Hay como tres. Formularios de evaluación. So if you like um, bureaucracy, <laughs> <laughs> you, can you, can they get past around? Tanya. Can you find them on the printer?